That's what I had in the list. Hello, and good afternoon, everybody, uh, and welcome to the California Small Farm Conference. Well, this is the moderator. Um, so, um, thank you for joining us. Um, if you are joining us, I would ask you. if you want to just keep your microphone and your camera um, off. Um, so, um, I'm just going to go ahead and... Um, so welcome um, for to, to the, today's workshop um, all about strawberries. Um, we are joined here by two experts in the field. So thank you very much for uh, for joining us. Uh, I'll encourage everybody to use the uh, the chat function to ask any questions, make comments, share resources. Um, and just want to give a huge uh, shout out to our presenters for coming to, to share uh, their knowledge, their wisdom, uh, and all the, 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 the tips of the trade. So Thank you for being here, and I'm going to pass it on to you and uh, take it from here. Thanks very much for being here. We appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, let me get my screen share going here. Okay. Moment. Okay, so welcome everybody. Um, we really appreciate you all joining us today. Um, I know it's your Sunday evening, and so we yeah, are really thankful that you wanted to join us and learn about strawberries. Uh, before we jump on in, I just wanted to quickly introduce myself and Margaret Lloyd, who's joining me today. My name is Lindsay Kelly. I'm a community education specialist based out of Yolo County. Um, I work with organic and small farms in Yolo, Solano, and Sacramento counties. And my work with strawberries centers primarily around working with um, small scale Hmong and Mian growers in our region. Uh, Margaret, do you wanna quickly introduce yourself here as well? Sure, hi everybody. My name is Margaret Lloyd and I'm the organic and small farms advisor serving Yolo, Solano, and Sacramento counties and I work with UC Cooperative Extension. So as you know, in California, we have a lot of coastal strawberry production, but it's also a really important and valuable crop to inland growers. So that's where Lindsay and I have been working hard to see how we can adapt and translate some of those practices to um, inland growers. So thanks for being here today. Okay, so let's jump on in here. So I wanted to set the stage um, this evening about strawberry production here in California. So as Margaret mentioned, um, a lot of production occurs on these kind of in these coastal areas. So along the central coast, let's think Watsonville and Salinas, and then a little bit further south, getting into Santa Maria, Orange County, and Oxnard. Now we do see some production that occurs in these inland regions. Uh, we see some of the Central Valley, down near Fresno, and then as you get farther north up into Sacramento and some of these other regions that you see here on the screen in blue. Um, and so this kind of begs the question, you know, we all know that the Central Coast is really great for strawberries, but why is it so great? And it really comes down to the fact that you could not hope for better conditions um, for production than what we get on the Central Coast. So as you may know, it has those really wonderful warm winters, but then the cool dry summers. And that's great because strawberries really don't like hot and humid climates. Um, those conditions will inhibit flowering. It can impact fruit growth. It can um, cause degrade degradation in fruit quality. And then it also is an ideal condition for diseases and pathogens um, to thrive. And so strawberries really like those environments where, you know, they're not, their roots aren't sitting in a lot of water. Those sandy loam and loam soils are gonna be great to ensure that there's water available when they need it, but it's not just gonna let their roots sit in kind of this oversaturated area. I mean, so for all of these reasons, we really see a lot of production occurring in the central coast. There's a lot of really large farms a lot of resources go towards those farmers, whether it be research, financial, and other support. And so as Margaret kind of mentioned when she introduced herself, our team 
kind of works to help bridge some of those knowledge gaps. We want to work with inland growers and some smaller growers, both, you know, along the coast and inland to think about how we can adapt that information and utilize the resources that are being put out to make them fit with the realities that exist for small farm production um, of strawberries in these inland areas. So with that, I kind of want to jump right on into it here. Um, at its essentials, kind of the pre-plant management and preparation of your fields are going to be very similar for small farms versus large farms in that you're going to be applying compost, you're gonna be applying, you know, terminating cover crops and, you know, adding other soil amendments um, to your soil and then turning that in um, to your fields as well. What's really exciting and we think a really cool opportunity within small farms is to use some alternative forms of weed and disease suppression in the form of occultation and solarization. And so you can see this top picture here, um, this black tarp, this is um, what occultation is. And so you're using a black silage tarp that's put down over the area you're targeting and it blocks out the light and then prevents those weed seeds from germinating. Solarization on the other hand is the use of clear plastic um, and that heats the soil up to a high temperature and can kill off any of those diseases or weed seeds that you have there. So while that may not be feasible on a really large scale, it's something that smaller farms and particularly organic farms can use um, to help manage weeds in a different way. And then some things that farms will do, you know, every couple of years, um, are the more intensive tillage treatments. So think like this deep ripping down to about two and a half or three feet. And that's done to improve some of those soil drainage and tilth um, components of your soil. So while it's not done every year, it is something that can be done, you know, every couple of years, depending on your soil texture and what other usages you have for your field. And then we have disking and bedding. That's something you have to do basically every single year because once you till in those, those amendments every time, you need to then recreate those beds that you'll be planting in. And speaking of those beds, you know, we all know what those really, you know, long lines of strawberry beds look like when they're out in the field. And from afar, you may not notice that there is some variability in what those beds may look like. So in these large in, um, industrial, you know, or commercial systems, you'll see these really tall square beds. They're about 12 inches high and two feet wide or so at minimum. Um, they can be even wider if you have, you know, upwards of four strawberry rows per bed. Um, and then you might have something like what you see in the top picture here. And these are going to be shorter, more rounded beds um, with the lines of strawberries compacted towards the middle. And the difference between them really comes down to harvesting. So with those tall square beds, it's going to make harvesting easier. So rather than kind of leaning over into the middle of the bed to harvest, kind of what you would see here in this top row, instead, as you or your harvest crew goes down the rows, you can pick berries from the immediate left and right, and it does make that harvest a little bit easier. Additionally, with those taller beds, it can help promote better drainage. So again, those strawberries really don't like having their roots sing in water, and so that can help improve some of the drainage. Um, with those um, berries. As we know, um, strawberry production is heavily reliant on plastic and use of plastic culture. And there are a couple of different um, plastics out there. And if you're trying to figure out what the best choice is for you, you can think about it in terms of what its effect is going to be on the soil. And so the different colors of plastic will affect the temperature of your soil in different ways. Um, so clear plastic is, the, you know, in the way that solarization did, it's going to heat your soil up, you know, six to nine degrees Fahrenheit, whereas white plastic is going to actually cool your soil a little bit. And so you kind of want to think about, okay, you know, what do I really want? What is the effect of that going to be? And so if you use clear plastic and you heat your soil, you may actually get your harvest a little bit earlier. So if you wanna take advantage of some of those um, higher prices earlier in the season, clear plastic may be the right choice for you. However, you also have to consider the fact that um, that clear plastic when it heats it up, plus some of that humidity that comes from those irrigation lines below, it may actually promote some of those soil borne diseases because you get those hot, humid climates. And so if you are already dealing with those soil borne diseases or you think you might be at risk for them, 
um, then maybe clear plastic is not the best option for you. On the opposite end of the spectrum, we do have that white plastic. It's going to cool your soil down a little bit. It's going to delay the maturity of your berries a little while. Um, so if you, again, if you really want a later harvest, that's great. And you make can make that choice. Um, and it will kind of help with some of, again, those soil borne disease mitigation strategies. So it's going to cool the soil. Um, that heat is a, you know, really large mitigating factor when it comes to the um, presence of soil borne diseases. And there's some really great tools out there for small farms for laying down plastic. We see two options here, one for tractors and one for um, hand tool scales. So the tractor, you know, it'll have those um, discs on the side that'll push the soil up and over. And then here in the bottom, this is a unit that's sold by Johnny Seeds. Um, it's retails for a little under $2,000 and it can help lay plastic. And then they also have a tea tape um, roll here as well. So you can go down your row and do both at the same time. And so there are options for smaller scale production to make this a little bit easier rather than potentially going through by hand like we see in this top picture and just putting these drops of soil all along your rows. And then another component of this is thinking about punching the holes in the soil for transplanting those berries. A lot of farmers um, in our region will take um, mulch hole burners um, and they'll go down the rows that way. There are some alternatives, again, for tractors and hand scale production. Uh, we have this implement here in the center, this black one that can just be attached to your tractor. Or we have the one here on the left that you can attach handles to and push it down the row as needed um, for um, punching holes. What's nice about that unit is that these silver spikes can be adjusted to different distances. So if you want to adjust the spacing between your berries, um, that's something that you can more readily adjust than something like what we see here in this picture where those um, hole punchers are in set spacing. So, you got your fields ready, everything's good to go. You open up your box of crowns that you got from the nursery. And now you have to kind of determine, are all of these worth planting? Um, and that comes down to thinking about, you know, what is the quality of those plants? Um, and so we get a question pretty regularly about whether or not there's a relationship between crown size and yield. Um, the long and short of it is that we really don't know. Um, studies have been done that, have you know variables some say yes there is relationship some say that there's not kind of where we think it lands is somewhere in the middle in that when your plants are in the field there are so many other factors and variables that will affect your um, crown health and your ultimate yield that we're not sure if it comes back solely to your crown size in the end instead we really suggest that you look at factors like root color and quality um, so you can see in these pictures here that we have these kind of white, tan, beige sort of colored roots. Those are indicative of really nice, healthy root structures. If you have roots that are kind of dark brown or black, or, you know, maybe a little bit slimy, that's potentially indicative that you have some sort of fungus, something like botrytis that's come in and infected your crowns and may cause those crowns to not thrive once they're planted into the soil. And so if we look at this, image here on the right, you can see that we have these really small crowns on the left, they have a small root structure, and then we have the larger crown here on the right with that nice large root structure. Um, we do think that the ideal potentially falls somewhere in the middle. Um, these large crowns may look great, but you may end up getting just a lot of vegetative growth out of them and a little bit less um, berry production in the end. And those small crowns may end up just not thriving. They just don't have enough root structure and aren't able to establish themselves well enough to survive. And so if you're growing in inland regions, it is kind of important to think about, you know, what are those stressors? What do my plants need to survive? And so maybe you do end up going for some of these larger crowns. And if you're on a coastal region, maybe you can go a little bit smaller because there's less stress to those plants. And so it really does kind of come back to thinking about what are the conditions I'm growing in? What do my plants look like? What do my fields look like? And then kind of using your skills and abilities and know-how to make that decision from there. And one way you can kind of really help ensure that those crowns look as great as possible before you put them into the field 
is to keep them cold. Um, so sometimes when you get the crowns from the nursery, um, you're just not quite ready to plant them. It may be a day or two before your um, fields are ready to go. And so put them in a cooler, keep them cold, put them in a temperature controlled room at your farm or at your house or something where you're not going to get a lot of temperature fluctuation. If you leave them out in the sun and in the warmth and everything else, it is going to allow um, some of those fungal, you know, those fungi to kind of grow and thrive in those conditions and then may affect your crowns further down the line. And so talking about cold, um, this is something that's really important for plant growth and plant um, health throughout the entire um, lifespan of those crowns. So even at the nurseries, they'll be talking about and tracking something called chilling hours. And those are the number of hours that those crowns spend within a certain range that allows them to resume a normal sequence of growth once they come out of their winter dormancy. And so the idea is that the more chill hours you get, the more uh, vigor in your vegetative growth you end up with later on. The caveat is though that the more vigor you get, you may get a decrease in fruiting. And so it's kind of this delicate balance. A lot of the times we'll see organic growers going for a higher range of chill hours because they want more vigor in their plants. And that's because they deal with more stress than maybe some conventional systems do. And so it helps those plants better withstand some of those external pressures. And those chilling hours are pretty much, you know, accumulated in two ways, either in field or after harvest when they're in cold storage in a cooler. Now, we don't have any, you know, really strong scientific information that states that in field is better than in storage. However, the generally accepted method is to think about getting those chill hours in the field. And that's because those crowns are going to be surrounded by those great soil microbial communities. They're going to get contact um, you know, with the soil and get those nutrients and water and things like that. Whereas if you have crowns in your cooler, they're just going to kind of sit there. They're not, you know, bare crowns sitting in a plastic bag. Um, and so, you know, thinking about that and that those infield chill hours can be important. For inland production, um, there is another kind of added component of this that's a little bit undiscovered and something we're kind of interested in. Um, and that's thinking about the possibility that there might actually be a third round of chill hours um, added onto these plants. And so you think about kind of these three periods of time. So you have the um, crowns that are at the nursery and they're in the fields and they're being exposed to cold temperatures. After they're harvested, they're going to go into a cooler where they're also going to be exposed to those cold temperatures and gain more chilling hours. And then they get to your farm and if you're planting in the fall, you put them in the ground in October. And then if you're inland, they're sitting in the ground over this winter period where temperatures are going to fall into that 28 to 45 degree Fahrenheit range. And so you may actually get some additional chill hours in the field once again. So it's kind of this sandwich of two sets of field um, in-field chill hours around a cooler um, section of chill hours. I don't really know if that second round of in-field chill hours makes a difference or not, or if it's going to change anything um, in terms of the in-field chill hours that occurred before. So when you're thinking about chill hours and, you know, you have these different varieties and you're trying to figure out where you should be, there are some suggestions out there based on the cultivar type and then the different varieties. And so if you're using UC varieties, they recommend for short day varieties to get about 300 to 400 hours. Um, and then day neutral will have about 400 to 600 hours. So when you get those plants from the nursery, you can ask them because they should be tracking chill hours that those plants have been exposed to and find out where those plants Answer all. One thing is, though, with this, um, that the harvest schedules at those nurseries are not based around chill hours. So they're going to harvest around a multitude of other factors, and some of the least important of which are those chill hours. So one year you may get berries that are crowns that have 150 chill hours on them, and then the next year you're going to get ones that have 350. Um, so it can be really variable, and that's just something to kind of factor into um, your decisions about when you're going to plant and things like that. So it's all kind of, you know, 
as with most things in agriculture, a little bit of like a guessing game of how are things going to look this year? How do I need to adapt? Um, and where do you want to fall um, in terms of what those chill hours may look like? And one of those industry terms that comes with chill hours are what we call frigo plants. Um, frigo plants are crowns that were grown at a low elevation nursery. So oftentimes these are those nurseries right along the coast. Um, and they're harvested and then put into coolers where they're going to get the bulk of their chilling hours. Um, so we're not talking in terms of hours or days, we're talking the matter of weeks and months. Um, so this is just kind of a colloquial term that we use um, to talk about the differences between some of the elevation nurseries versus low elevation nurseries and where those chill hours are coming from. After you've gotten your plants, you're getting ready to plant. You've got your beds prepped, you've got everything good to go. Now it's time to you know, take those crowns that you said, yep, these are great, this is what I wanna plant and start that process. Um, these are two steps in the process that are not you know, the most mandatory. Up here in Sacramento, we have some growers that do cut their roots and prehydrate their plants. We have some that don't. They both swear by their own methodology and say that they don't see an impact one way or the other with their choices. So that's, this is something that can really, you know, be up to you. Um, with root cutting, it's recommended to do that if you just have a really large root structure um, and you're worried that those roots might be, you know, a little bit too compacted within the hole in the soil to get good um, establishment in there. So you can cut up to a third of those roots, depending on their length and density, to get to a point where you think they're going to be happy once they get into the soil. And then we have the um, pre-plant, like the pre-soak of those crowns before planting. So about um, four to six hours before you start planting, put those crowns in some water. Even if you pre-irrigated your fields, you know, we want to ease the transition for those crowns into the soil. Um, and so just giving them that extra boost is always great. You can even add in some fertilizer like fish meal or something like that into that water just to kind of give it once again, that extra boost kind of improve its chances for good establishment once it gets into the soil. And then if you're planting on a small enough scale where you're just kind of holding your crowns in your in a bucket as you go, fill the bucket with water and then carry that as you go down the row. Um, so you can, you know, it's good to do that and it's feasible at a small scale to get good pre-plant hydration into those crowns. Once those crowns are in the soil and you're starting to think about, okay, what does my management look like from here on out? As always, it comes back to nutrient management. With strawberries, um, we have this table here on the left that shows some sufficiency ranges for what we wanna see in the leaves before you start harvesting the berries. And so for you know the big three NPK, we wanna see about 3.1 to 3.8% of nitrogen in those leaves. We want to see, you know, almost 1% of um, phosphorus and then 1.8 to 2.2% of the potassium. So strawberries really love nitrogen and potassium. Um, those are its two big um, nutrients. And so in order to reach those sufficiency levels, these are kind of the suggested rain ranges for what you want um, to apply over the course of a season for N, P, and K. And the uptake of those berries will kind of start off slow. As we know, if you're planting in the fall, they're going to go into a dormancy period. So their nutrient uptake is going to be pretty low. So you can see in this seasonal and uptake curve here on the left for this October planted um, um, strawberry plant, I didn't really start seeing exponential end uptake until, you know, sometime in the early to mid spring. Um, and so you still want some nutrients there to help it along and to get through that dormancy period. But then once you hit flowering, the uh, nutrient uptake is just going to skyrocket. And so we're going to see really high uptake of nitrogen, of potassium, of calcium, things like that here as the plants get into the flowering green fruit and harvesting periods. A lot of our growers up here in the Sacramento region um, will use things like triple 15, CAM 17, UAN 32 um, for fertilizers. Um, those are, of course, our, uh, are going to be more of our conventional growers. 
Um, a lot of them will use triple 15 as their pre-plant fertilizer that will go in here at the beginning. And so there are some, you know, different options out there to help ensure that those um, plants have adequate nutrition um, for successful growth. And if you're looking for a really great resource on trying to figure out, you know, okay, great, I want to give my plants, you know, the best chance possible to grow, Daniel Geisler out of UC Davis has a really wonderful resource online that can help break down all of this for you. So he has these for multiple different crops, not just strawberries. And if you go to this website, you can click on each of these different um, tabs here and it'll drop down and show you rates and what types of fertilizer and how to apply and things like that. So I really highly recommend going to his website to go look at that because it's really a good way to kind of think about how you're going to manage that nutrient uptake for your plants over the course of the season. Okay, so I've thrown a lot of information at you all in about 25 minutes. Um, a lot of what I've talked about so far can be found in some really great resources. Um, these are three of many out that are out there. Um, and these are ones that we use pretty regularly. And so I just kind of wanted to share them with you all. I do want to, again, note the caveat that these are designed for large scale coastal growers. And so when you take the information out of these manuals and these resources, just have that in the back of your mind that what you're reading may need to be adapted to fit the needs of your farm, whether it's a small farm or inland production or something like that. So I wanna take a quick pause for a second. Are there any questions or burning comments that I can answer for the moment? I haven't been monitoring the chat or anything like that. So is there anything I can address right now? I was helping out in the chat, Lindsay. Oh, perfect. Thank um, you, Margaret. Yeah, so I don't know if I answered the individual's question about UC varieties. Um, but you can see that there. So UC has a strawberry breeding program. So some varieties that you see offered at some California nurseries like Lassen Canyon originate from the California strawberry breeding program and some don't. Um, typically speaking, these varieties are grown and bred for the commercial industry on the coast. And that's where most of the trialing occurs and the focus is on that industry. However, um, that's part of our, our work currently is to identify and trial some of these varieties in inland climates. So a number of strawberry growers know which ones work best inland. Typical varieties include, for the fresh market, include varieties like Albion and Chandler. Um, but there's other varieties that are worth discussing, and Lindsay will get to that. So if yes. you have more questions, I'll be monitoring the chat. Perfect. Um, or you can ask them now. <clears throat> okay. So maybe since we had a question about varieties, I'll kind of jump into that here a little bit and provide some context around variety selection. Oops. Let's go the right direction. There we go. Um, so pivoting now and kind of setting the stage for talking about some of this variety selection. Um, soil borne diseases are a really important consideration nowadays, especially within the breeding communities and growing communities. And a lot of this has to do with, you know, the post of the phase out of methyl bromide. Um, so when that phase out happened, that caused some of these diseases that had been suppressed for many years to become really apparent and cause a lot of issues with growers across the state and you know across the country as well. Um, and so now there's being a lot, there's a lot of work being done to kind of figure out how do we address that. And so often when we're talking about soil-borne diseases and strawberries, we talk about the big four. Um, and that's macrophomena, fusarium wilt, verticillium, and phythophthora. Um, those are kind of the big four. Uh, they can be hugely devastating to crop yields, um, which is why there's a lot of work being done. If you're in your field and you're trying to determine what's causing some issues, there are some ways that you can kind of think about, you know, is this macrophomena, is it verticillium, things like that. 
It's not always easy to tell, especially if you're talking about macrophomina or fusarium. Those two will present almost identically in strawberries in the field. So the young leaves in the middle are gonna remain green, but those older leaves on the side will begin to wilt and turn brown, and then eventually the entire plant dies. Uh, if you were to take a vertical cut of the vascular tissue, like you see here in this picture in the bottom right, you would see that it's turning like that orangey kind of dark brown color. Um, that's, you know, indicative that you might have some of these, you know, one of these soil borne pathogens present in your field. For macrophomina and fusarium, they are really indicative of the fact that your plants are stressed. Um, so it can be a combination of things like too much fruit load on the plants, too high, too much water, so they're overly saturated, high heat, things like that. Those are all going to be stressors that can cause these two to become more prevalent within your fields. Verticillium is going to be characterized by some of the intervenal browning on those outside leaves. Um, so you can see that in the picture here. The inner leaves themselves will remain mostly green. You still might see some brownish black streaks in there, but mostly their size is going to be pretty stunted. Um, and so the, the coloring itself is really what's most distinctive when it comes to identifying verticillium within your field, um, especially compared to the other three. And then finally, when we have that um, Phythophthora crown and root rot, um, it's going to present similarly to Macrophomena and Fusarium, except that instead of having those young leaves stay nice and green, those are gonna be the ones that are going to be the first to wilt and die and then followed by plant collapse. Um, again, you can cut open the crown tissue um, and take a look at the color and it will look kind of that brown color. And then if you see the roots here in this picture, are there again, they're like that bra dark brown, um, black color. And that's indicative that there's some sort of rot going on. And so that's usually caused by periods of prolonged oversaturation within the soil. And so there's so those spores that are in there are going to swim through the water and they're going to go into the roots and they're going to infect those plants. Um, so these are the big four that we often talk about in strawberry production. Along the coast, um, we see macrophomina and fusarium wilt accounting for about 30% of the overall disease pressure. Um, it's important to note that again, this is for coastal regions. Um, in inland regions, we expect that the incidence of macrophomina and fusarium are going to be a little bit greater than 30% because those are seen a lot more in high temperature environments. So in those inland regions where it gets much hotter, we expect that macrophomina and fusarium are going to be more prevalent than they would otherwise be. The thing with these is that they don't necessarily just appear in isolation from one another. We are seeing rates of co-infection in fields. And so the Cal Poly Strawberry Center did this study where they went into fields where there was disease pressure already present, and they sampled to see if there were rates of co-infection occurring. And they found that 22% of those fields were positive for two pathogens and 5% were positive for three. So just because you have one doesn't mean you're going to luck out and not get any of the others. And so this is why it's really important to think about what cultivars you're using and test your soil and plants to determine what's going on. And so if you want to do those diagnostic tests, there are a bunch of resources out there where you can get those tests done. One really great one um, is the Cal Poly Strawberry Center. They have a pathology lab that's dedicated um, to strawberry testing, and it's funded by the California right. Strawberry Commission. Um, mm -hmm. It's said to be um, free to all California grower, strawberry growers and those that are involved with the industry. I do have that little note there, only because we couldn't confirm one way or the other whether or not you actually had to be a part of the commission to access the free resources or not. We're still waiting to hear back, so hopefully I'll get some information and we can let you all know um, through the conference system, or if anybody here does know, and you can share that information, we'd appreciate it. Um, but if you want to use their resources, reach out to them just to confirm. Um, but if for some reason you're not able to, there are so many other resources out there. So you can use something like the California Seed and Plant Lab, TriCal, and a whole host of other ones. So if you're not sure what the best place to go is, reach out to your local technical assistance provider, reach out to your local farm advisor, 
and most of the time they're going to have a list and no not in knowledge of other labs excuse me of other labs that are out there so you've gotten your test done you find out oh no i've got diseases in my field how do you then go about dealing with it um as we probably know, those coastal systems will use a lot of fumigation techniques. Um, methyl bromide was the go-to for many years, but with that um, being phased out, we're now using chloropicrin and 1,3-dichloropropene, um, either um, individually or um, in tandem with each other. However, we are small farms. We are you know, some organic farmers out here as well. And we know that fumigation is not economically feasible, nor is it maybe what we want. So thankfully there are other options out there. Um, one of that is one of those is to adjust some of your management practices. Um, as I said earlier, moisture is a really major part of creating those environments where these diseases thrive. And so ensuring that you're not over irrigating is going to be really important to that. Um, that's will kind of ensure that you don't get those really humid climates where those pathogens can thrive. Another component is adjusting your fertilization to ensure that when you're applying fertilizers is at those periods of high uptake for the plants. So in the case of verticillium, uh, excess nitrogen is a major risk factor in its development. So making sure that nitrogen is being applied at those points of high end uptake in the plants will help ensure um, that you lower your chances of the effects of verticillium. And then there's crop rotation. Um, this is a longer term mitigation strategy. It's not gonna be a quick fix. Um, some studies have shown that crop rotations with non-host plants like broccoli can actually help to significantly reduce the levels of verticillium and fusarium in your soil over time. And so ensuring that you're doing proper rotations and not just growing strawberries year after year after year can help reduce some of that pressure as well. And then we have solarization. Again, going back to the plastic that we've talked about a couple of times, using the clear plastic to heat your soil up to a point where it helps kill the pathogens um, is a really great option. And that idea of using heat to kill off those soil board pathogens is what's kind of behind these ideas of steam treatments. Um, so you can see in these pictures here, the top picture um, is a steam injector um, it connects to a hose here and then it's brought into the field and inserted into the soil. Um, it injects steam about nine inches deep into the soil and has a diameter of about seven inches around it. Um, so this is a treatment that's done before planting and before um, your plastic goes on. And then once the soil cools, um, you can then transplant into it. And so the steam is kind of being sourced from this machine here. Um, this is a Sioux steam flow machine, so it has a hose that will connect to this to this implement here. You can also use those Sioux steam flow machines um, with just a single long hose that comes out of it that's covered with a big blanket that traps the steam in there. And that blanket will allow the steam to permeate throughout the soil and provides that steam treatment um, mostly just to the kind of top couple inches. Um, so the real difference between these two is that if you have the injector, it'll go down deeper, whereas just using a blanket is only going to hit those top couple inches of your soil. Another cool method of um, mitigating the effects of soil borne diseases that's come out of UC Santa Cruz more recently for strawberries is anaerobic soil disinfestation, or ASD. Uh, ASD is the addition of a labile carbon source um, They've done a lot of work with uh, rice bran, followed by irrigation to fill those pore space. So you want to keep your irrigation to above field capacity. And once you do that, you're creating those nice anaerobic conditions. And when that happens, that causes the microbial community to shift. Um, so it's going to shift towards those that are obligate anaerobes and more importantly, some facultative anaerobes. So those are those nice fermenters. And the fermenters and the fermentation process are really what's key um, within this methodology to decrease the amount of um, soil borne disease, um, diseases in your soil. Um, so Joji's team out of UC Santa Cruz has found that they were able to consistently get about an 80 to 100% reduction in verticillium um, when using a rate of about nine tons per acre of that rice bran. Um, so if you're a small farm and you're just trying to target a couple of rows, 
this is something that may be an option for you. You don't necessarily have to use rice bran. You can use other carbon sources as well. So if you're a farmer that has a cover crop on your field, you can terminate that cover crop and mix it in with the rice bran to help supplement um, some of that carbon source as well. Um, so that'll help kind of decrease some of the economics that come with purchasing that carbon source and can allow you to continue to use that um, cover crop rotation within your fields. One thing that is important to note about um, ASD and the trials that have been run on it is that they're still being primarily done along the coast. And so they've found that it's been really successful in verticillium along the coastal areas. But if you're trying to treat fusarium or macrophamina, you need higher temperatures in order to achieve that. And so this could be a good option if you're growing in the inland areas where it does get hotter. Um, so this is, you know, an opportunity to maybe test this out. And so if you're in an inland area, it'd be really interesting to see and maybe really interested to know more about whether or not this can be a viable option in those warmer areas for treating um, verticillium and macrophamina. So we will share this three pager from Joji with you all. I'm going to upload it to Sketch and I'll send everybody an out an email. Um, so if you want to get more information about it, you can look at that. And then reach out to Joji and his team. Um, he's always really helpful and knows how to point people to different resources as well. Um, so that could be another option. And then getting to the question that came in through the chat earlier about cultivars. How do we think about cultivars and our selection of cultivars? One important component of that is thinking about how they can be used to mitigate the effects and the presence of soil-borne diseases in the field. And so UC Davis has been doing a lot of work recently on breeding cultivars that are resistant to some of these soil-borne diseases, especially Fusarium wilt. Um, so berries like Albion and Chandler are very susceptible to Fusarium wilt, although Ch Chandler a little bit less so, um, whereas these new cultivars are really specifically meant to help um, in fields where Fusarium and other soil-borne diseases are a problem. And so in 2023, they came out with four day neutral varieties. That's UC Monarch, Golden Gate, Keystone, and Eclipse. And then one short day variety, which is UC Surf Line. So in addition to their Fusarium wilt resistance, these varieties are also bred for improved harvest practices and times to improve their perishability. So they have a longer shelf life. They're going to have some better just kind of taste qualities as well. And so they're trying to think about what are the changing levels of disease pressure throughout the state and how can we create cultivars that are going to work well in those environments. And so of these new cultivars that have come out, um, we expect that UC Eclipse is really going to be the most economically important cultivar. Um, it's a summer um, planted variety. Um, so in comparison to Cortola, which is the currently the most economically important summer planting cultivar. It's going to be leading the way in terms of yield. It has better fruit quality. It's larger fruit. And so that can be a really important um, changeover that's going to occur. But what that means for small farmers, though, is that unfortunately, it may be really hard to get a hold of. So a lot of these nurseries are going to prioritize um, doing as few large orders as possible rather than a lot of small orders. So they're going to send these UC Eclipse plants to these larger farms. However, you know, thankfully there are some other options out there. UC Mojo and Finn are two similar plants that may fall into a similar production niche as UC Eclipse. And I'm going to get into that here shortly. But we did have a question earlier about thinking about how do we select plants that are appropriate for the region? What do we need to think about when it comes to that? And so three fruit characteristics that we often think about are bricks, firmness, and fruit size. Um, bricks is a measure of sweetness, um, and I have these cultivars listed here in descending order in terms of sweetness. We have mostly UC varieties, but I also wanted to include some non-UC varieties that get a lot of use in California. So we have Sweet Anne, Radiance um, in there as well. And so when we're thinking about the sweetness, you know, a lot of direct to consumer um, farmers like to go for those sweeter berries. Um, they may not have a longer shelf life, but they taste really, really good. 
And that's why they're good for direct to consumer marketing. For some of these newer varieties that are coming out, they are less sweet, but where they really shine is in their ability to maintain their quality post-harvest much better. And so we're gonna find these coming into grocery stores and places where they're going to be shipped further afield than California, and they're gonna fill that niche as well. When we think about, you know, what's the right um, choice from a berry? It goes beyond just the sweetness. If you're in a hot climate, um, there's going to be a lot of sun pressure. And so if you have a really soft berry, you know, they don't have a thick skin, they're going to die really quickly. They're going to get sunburned and you're going to lose that berry quality really quickly. So in Sacramento, we have some farmers growing Chandler and Albion and they're finding that their berries die off really early in the summer because they just get scorched by the sun. And so thinking about what that sun pressure and may look like is going to be an important consideration as well when picking your berries. This handy little graph here on the right um, is something that we got from the UC um, breeding program. What it shows is the relative distribution of the cultivars based on the bricks percentage. So if you look at something like Chandler that has a bricks percentage of 9.9, it's gonna be right up here in the second to last bar on the right. So, oops, sorry. Um, so what that tells us is that it's going to be sweeter than a vast majority of the other cultivars that are out there. And so if your goal is to have a really sweet berry, that is where you kind of wanna be because you're not gonna get much better than that. I mean, you can get into Sweet Anne and some other cultivars, but if you're looking at UC varieties, that's you know where you wanna be. Whereas compared to some of um, the new varieties, you know, Keystone, Golden Gate, Eclipse, and Monarch, they're going to be down here a little bit lower. So you're going to have a decent portion that are a little bit sweeter and some that are a little bit less sweet. So this can just kind of help you, you know, put into perspective where that cultivar kind of falls in terms of berry sweetness. Are you getting the best bang for your buck in terms of picking a berry that's going to get, you know, that taste that you really want? So this is a little bit of an overwhelming slide, but I think it's a really great um, visualization of how the overlapping harvest and planting periods look within a calendar year for strawberries. Um, so they're split up into three groups. Um, we have here at the top, these extreme day neutral cultivars. They are the summer planted, excuse me. They are the summer planted varieties. And then down here on the bottom, we have these fall planted varieties. Um, and this shows us that there are some opportunities for production that may be underutilized at the moment. Um, and so we can see from a harvest perspective over here on the right, you know, October, November, December, that's really when some of this harvest falls off. And then again, we see in January, February, March, we're also seeing a low level of production. And so when we think about, okay, how do we maximize our production time to get what we want and what we need um, for this to be an economically viable crop for us? And so this is where there's like some really unique opportunities coming out, especially with um, UC Eclipse, um, Mojo, and Finn. And so I kind of want to dive into the opportunity that those cultivars present for us. And so these three are unique and that they're what we call extreme day neutrals. And that means that they were bred specifically for summer planting. So rather than um, planting um, in the fall and then harvesting in the spring and summer, um, the harvest is going to begin in the late summer and last through the fall and into the early winter. Um, now, again, the timing that we're seeing here on the screen is from information that's for the central coast. Um, but where it might present a really unique opportunity for inland production is that with some of these temperature changes, we actually may be able to get almost one and a half um, harvest cycles out of it. So we plant these berries in May, June, July. They start producing later on in the summer and into the fall, and then they go into a dormancy over the winter. And there's a thought that potentially we might see another round of production occurring again in the spring. This is not something that's been tested. Um, it's just a guess by highly educated people at UC Davis. Um, it's something that we're really interested and in. they're really interested in finding out if it's possible. So while UC Eclipse may be bought out by some of these larger farms in the coast, 
Mojo and Finn may be really great opportunities for smaller and inland producers to try this out and see if this is something that might be feasible for them. And, you know, if it doesn't work and you don't get that second round of berries, then it kind of ends right around that time when you'd be replanting um, those crowns anyway. Um, so it's going to, you know, potentially fill in a certain void. And so we can see how that looks um, in the grand scheme of things if we go back to that overall view. And so I've added back in here that kind of half round of um, harvest period here. And so if you're now planting Mojo or Finn along with Chandler or Albion, you can get some harvest periods that extend through most of the year. So, you know, you can get something that starts in April and extends all the way through almost the end of the calendar year. So in this way, we're kind of starting to see some of the lines being blurred between short day and day neutral cultivars, especially when it comes to inland production, which is really exciting and I think presents a really unique opportunity for us to kind of look at, okay, you know, we have all this great information that is going on for growers along the coast. What does this mean for us in these inland regions? And so we can kind of play with them and blur those lines a little bit more and find some more unique opportunities for production that might allow us to get more out of these strawberry plants. Okay, so high tunnels. We're talking about this because this can also impact your production. So if we go back here to this schematic, we see that we've adjusted some of these harvest periods. We can continue to kind of artificially adjust them, you know, with the white plastic and with high tunnels. Um, we have a grower up here in Sacramento. Um, this is a picture of his farm here on the top where he has um, erected high tunnels over his strawberry fields. And with that, his harvest period has actually been pushed up a month. So it still ends a little bit earlier, um, but he is able to get into that earlier production window where prices are higher. He still has some uncovered strawberry fields that are hiding there in the back of that picture. And so he is on that little bit more of that traditional schedule. But with those high tunnels, he is seeing a shift in his harvest. There are the added benefits that we're also seeing some benefits in terms of disease mitigation. Um, because those berries are protected from the rain, there's less um, you know, chance of oversaturation, protection from the sun, so that can help decrease the incidence of soil-borne diseases and pathogens. So there are a multitude of effects that may come through um, with having high tunnels added in addition to some of these other management strategies. And so if high tunnels are something you're interested in, thankfully NRCS has their high tunnel initiative where they do provide financial assistance for those who are interested in adding them to their farm. So we highly recommend reaching out to NRCS um, and some other your other technical advisors who may be well versed in these programs to learn about how you can apply for that sort of financial assistance. Now, once you harvest your berries, you know, we get to enjoy them and we wanna make sure that we get to enjoy them as long as possible. So I'm not gonna go too in depth about post-harvest because I know we've been here a while and I wanna get to some questions and things like that. But it's good to know that, you know, the optimum temperature for storage of berries after harvest is around 32 degrees and with a relative humidity of about 90 to 95%. When Margaret and I were working on this presentation the other day, we found this really cool um, article from 1966 that looked at how temperature fluctuations over the course of 72 hours can affect the decay and rot of those berries. So you can see here um, that if you have the berries kept at 41 degrees for a full 72 hours, your decay is only about 1.8%. Um, but if you have some temperature fluctuations with longer and longer periods at a higher temperature, that decay is going to increase exponentially. You're going to go from 6.3 to 7.5 to 31% decay until you get the entire time at a high temperature of 68 degrees and you have almost 70% decay in your berries. And so keeping them at a cold temperature consistently really will help ensure that those berries last as long as possible. And so this is just, you know, we would love to, you know, have the ideal, you know, where there's a separate cooler for every single crop that we grow and each one can be set to the ideal conditions, but we know that that's not possible. So as long as you're able to kind of keep those berries in a cool, dry place that has, you know, some good air movement, 
that's going to be really critical in helping ensure that those berries don't go bad really quickly. And that means that you can um, have longer time for them to be sold. You're going to get less um, crop loss, things like that in the end. So that's, again, another important consideration. Okay. Last thing, I appreciate you all sticking with me so far. Um, we have noted that there have been some changes in nursery production um, over the past year and what they're requiring for purchasing. Um, Lassen Canyon in particular now requires a 30,000 plant minimum. They prefer that it only be of one variety and on a case by cases, they may allow for mixing of up to two varieties within that minimum, but they really do prefer it just be one. And again, that's going back to, they wanna fill as few large orders as possible. But there is hope, you know, there are plenty of other um, nurseries out there that have much lower minimums. We have this resource, which is something that we will share with you all after the presentation. There are many, many other nurseries that have much lower plant order minimums. And then a second option is to kind of create your own availability. Um, one of our um, our coworkers who works at the strawberry breeding program suggested that, you know, if there's a variety that you're really interested in that's lesser known or is not readily available, you know, work as a collective with other growers in your area. If you have a couple people that are really interested in trying out this variety, get together and approach the sales arm of some of these smaller nurseries and ask them if it's possible to plant this cultivar for you. And so in that way, you may be able to access some of these varieties that are harder to find and source from other places. So that's, you know, a great option and something to look into as well um, and worth reaching out to um, a local nursery if you're interested in trying something new and different. So with that, I'm going to stop talking. Um, one thing um, that we want to do while we're doing this question and answer session um, is to do a word cloud. Um, we want to know what challenges you face with strawberry production. Um, so Margaret is going to drop the link um, to this word cloud in the chat. I'm going to pull it up on my screen here so we can kind of see some live feedback from people about what are some of those challenges you can face. Um, so we'd really enjoy getting some of that information from you all. Um, so with that, I'm going to stop the share of my screen and I'm going to pull up that word cloud so people can see it. Okay, so with that, um, we would love to answer questions. So does anybody have anything else that they would like to talk about that we haven't already covered um, today or that Margaret hasn't um, covered in the chat? So while people are thinking um, and filling out this word cloud, um, I do want to note that we will be sharing um, this slideshow and some of the other resources that I talked about today with you all. Um, I'm going to upload it to Sketch, and then I will send out um, an email to everybody through that platform so you know that it's been um, uploaded so you can reference that please again, reach out to us. Um, we'd love to kind of provide some more assistance. Um, Margaret, anything you would like to add to this as well? No, that was, you did a great job. Um, I'm interested in hearing from people. Um, small scale inland strawberry producers have different issues and different concerns. And um, as Lindsay mentioned, <clears throat> We have a team um, that includes the strawberry industry, commercial strawberry growers, um, helping to make that shift to identifying the needs and the resources and what we can do to help inland strawberry production be more viable and a better part of a diversified production system. So we really wanna know what are the big issues 
and what are the resources that you need in order to uh, be successful. <clears throat> I see snails. I see managing runners, um, mulch, propagation. The question about propagation is an interesting one. So the commercial industry tends to treat strawberries as a one-year crop, and that's largely because the first year of strawberry production, those berries are larger. And so from a labor standpoint, it's more efficient to harvest them. Um, and a second point is that when you have second year berries, the insects in particular tend to build up. And so they can have more issues with insects in second year berries. And so that's why the industry tends to focus on treating strawberries more like annual crops. Inland growers may um, have the winter season that could kill off some of those insect pathogens. And there could be reasons that a second year might work for a inland producer. <clears throat> so there's, there's certainly nuance and adaptation for different types of growing conditions. Some commercial growers will turn in their second year crops to a U pick type of a situation so that the public is, quote unquote, <laughs> dealing with the labor of harvesting smaller berries, more but smaller berries. So the yield tends to be higher, but the berries are smaller. This is good. We have some good comments in the um, word cloud. Runners. So what are people mean when they say runners? Are they asking about how to deal with them, like how to effectively prune them? Or are you asking about how to propagate them? If anyone wants to come off mute to talk, to describe what they're saying when you say runners, how to propagate them. <clears throat> Is that the same as um, some of the other runner comments? So the main reason people are using the um, strawberry crowns has a lot to do with getting clean strawberry stock and also for the chill time that accompanies them. So the added vigor that comes from the crowns. <clears throat> so propagating them, uh, as you know, it can be as simple as taking those runners and um, potting them up. Yeah, overcrowding. So is that um, more than a one-year crop? <clears throat> so uh, typically the runners are pruned at the beginning of the season and some growers um, remove all the first flowers. So the idea is to focus on developing the roots and developing the foliage so that then the plant invests in fruit. We did see a higher amount of runners growing. We had some farmers that came to us as well with concerns about the number of runners that they had coming out. And when we asked the UC program um, about that, they thought that in that particular situation, especially up here, that may have been the result of the really wet winter um, last year that we had. And so there wasn't, they didn't really have a clear answer on why that was, um, Frederic, if that was kind of what you're getting at, um, that at least last year, um, they attributed those high numbers of runners to just like the really excessively wet winter we had and just how things kind of took off once that growing season started in the spring. And that is a typical management that happens. So folks are going in early um, or like late winter, early part of the new year to be removing those runners. Yeah, that seems likely. Yeah, there can also be a snail slug issue when um, straw is used as a mulch. So if you're using biomass as opposed to a plastic mulch, 
uh, folks have seen an increase in roly polies and snails and slugs because they love the cover of that material. You have your other questions, Lindsay? <clears throat> I do. Um, yeah, so we were going to send out um, a post, um, a Google form to everybody. Um, and so let me pull up what I was going to talk about. Just give me one moment. Yeah, as Lindsay's pulling that up, <clears throat> Some of the, um, as I was mentioning, we're, we're part of a big group of folks who are focused on the inland and small scale strawberry producers. And so we really are, are interested in hearing from you and staying in touch with you so that we can tailor um, our programming and our resources and our upcoming workshops to address your needs and interests. So you'll so find dropped, in that form some of those questions. <laughs> yeah, we'd love for you to fill that out um, when you have a chance. It doesn't have to be this evening, um, but that'll, again, as Margaret said, help us determine what's going on out there and how we can adjust our programming and work um, to be as helpful as possible for growers and other providers out there. If you're local on an ongoing basis, we have varieties for you to try. So you can stay in touch with us if you're interested in trialing some varieties. Um, we've been working closely with a lot of our local growers to get out um, a couple of boxes of some of these varieties. Um, in particular, some of these um, extreme day neutrals, but also disease resistant varieties. So if you um, add your email in that Google form, then we can um, keep you in the loop when that comes up. Um, we've been, in the last couple of years, we've um, trialed about 30,000 plants in growers fields. And so um, it's a really great opportunity to, to test some of these new varieties and even access some that are hard to get otherwise. Yeah, at the moment we have <laughs> all the new UC varieties are out in fields being trialed. And then we also have a variety called Eclair um, that's out in the field that's supposed to have some good disease resistance and flavor as well. So those are what we're currently working on, but may have others come up as well over time. So what other questions are out there? Sunday night, everybody is ready for day to end and get ready for the work week. <laughs> Hi, mine's not really a question, but um, just wondering whether you have farmers that you've worked with that don't do the rotations and their success with um, strawberries in that scenario? Rotations is in terms of like broccoli or other crops? Um, well, I've heard that in order to try to prevent a lot of these soil-borne diseases and pathogens, most strawberry growers get told to rotate the location of the strawberries every year. Yep. So um, that's kind of what I mean. Yeah, that's a great question. So we have the situation among a large group of growers that we work with that they almost exclusively grow strawberries and the land is really limited because it tends to be peri-urban areas. And so um, they're often growing back-to-back -back strawberries. And it's pretty impressive <laughs> um, how long they can go. Um and so I think that's a big, uh, 
part of growing varieties that have these resistance packages is that um, if you didn't have disease resistant packages, you would be seeing issues a lot earlier. Um, and so maybe it's um, a blessing and a curse to have it because it can kind of promote what you might call less best practices. Um, but we see growers growing strawberries back to back pretty intensively with no cover crops um, for more than a decade. And in some cases, if you get, you do get disease buildup. And at that point, it's really extreme and difficult to escape. And so um, what I've seen is the situation in which um, you can get away with it for a long time, but then when the problem comes, it's pretty severe and hard to recover from and takes a pretty extreme measure. Organic growers are different now. So that's with conventional growers. Um, on the coast, the, um, the general lore is that you wanna rotate out of strawberries for three to four years. And that's because you don't have a lot of the um, conventional uh, materials that you can apply to manage insects and soil-borne pathogens. And so there is a significant difference between conventional and organic growers when it comes to the importance of crop rotation. And additionally, if you're growing for the fresh market, you may want to be growing varieties that have less of a disease package. And that may also uh, sort of put more pressure on you to be growing, um, be using more best practices. Yeah, trichoderma or other microorganisms for disease. Um, there's been some amount of work on that. So trichoderma, it's really important to be getting that in at the root zone. Um, your best chances is to have that root microbe interaction. And so um, I've seen um, some successful trials where trichoderma is being applied as a root drench. Um, and that's an opportunity, like Lindsay was saying, where you're doing the hydration step to be adding trichoderma or other uh, beneficial microorganisms and getting them in at that root um, interface, try and get them colonized maybe um, before they're actually planted. And then they'll have pretty good um, chances of providing some amount of suppression or defense at the plant root. We have one minute left. Um, mm, for drying, I don't have a good answer for that. I don't know. Um, yeah. I imagine I've never really pursued this. Maybe the drying, you want varieties that can slice well or that um, are easy to handle. So um, I'm, I'm not really sure if, if firmness is a category that you look at for drying. <clears throat> That's a good question. So thanks for putting that on our radar. Wonderful. Well, oh, um, the resource Darlene, list for the nurseries. Yeah, Darlene, I'll send that out um, to everybody. I'm gonna do like, after we all get off here, I'm just gonna send everything out in a big PDF and we'll have links to all the resources I talked about, including that nursery list. And I do try and update that when I get information. So we try and keep that updated. So it's six o'clock, everybody. Thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us this evening. I hope you got something out of this talk and you enjoy the next couple of days of workshops and speakers. There's a really great lineup coming up um, and we were excited to be here on this first day to help kick things off. So enjoy the rest of your night. Feel free to, again to reach out to Margaret or I if you wanna keep in touch or have any further questions, we're always happy to help. So thank you. Thanks everybody.